prepare to play this song, you know, I recall a time uh, in the university that I got to the end of the school year and I still owed a little bit of money uh, 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 towards tuition and I just didn't have that money to, to pay it and, and so I, you know, tried to psych myself up as much as I could to go to the, the finance office and explain to them that, you know, I'll try to pay it as soon as I can. But um, I knew that I, in order to register for the next year of class, I needed to, to pay that um, before I was able to register. And so I finally psyched myself up enough to, to go to the finance office. And just as I'm, I'm on my way, the finance officer sees me and she, she says, David, I, I need to see you. I'm like, oh, I, I know. <laughs> but she, and so I go and I see her right away. I follow her to her office, and she says to me, I have some good news to you. I'm like, oh. And, and she says to me, she says there was an anonymous donor who paid off the balance of your tuition. Wow, and I was so relieved, like in so many different ways, because God knows that I wanted to pay, but I just didn't have the, but he knew exactly how he was going to take care of it. And it's the same way with, with our lives, you know. We live here on earth. We, we, we are all journeying towards that heavenly goal. And, and while we are unsure of how life is going to go, we are assured that Jesus paid it all and that all we have to do is believe on him. And so the song I'm going to play is uh, Jesus Paid It All.
last couple of weeks, we've had the opportunity to enjoy um, our virtual camp meeting, and, and now we, you know, as we uh, have enjoyed that experience, uh, we, I guess, kind of go back into as close to what we are used to um, this morning, and so a question for you out here. How many of you speak more than one language? I, I know a few people here speak more than one language. All right. Felicia doesn't put up her hand, but I know she speaks like three or four or five languages. <laughs> Six. Six languages, Jenny? Wow. Anybody else? Marianne? John? Cool, cool. Well, Mark, you speak more than one language. same boat as you is alive. I've, I spent five years trying to learn Spanish and I can say maybe three or four words. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent four years, four years trying to learn French and I, I can say merci beaucoup. <laughs> Took me four years to learn that. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to go abroad to, to do evangelism and it's amazing how this thing called language, you know, how it, how it works, you know. Um, so last year, just over a year ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Philippines and to, to preach there. And I was quite worried because I don't speak Tagalog. And I was worried about how many of them there may speak English. But, you know, every time you go abroad to do these things, they always provide translators and praise the Lord for for translators, because the gift that they have is definitely a gift from God. The year before that, I, I had the opportunity to, to go to Lesotho, which is in, in just in the middle of South Africa, and I was concerned there as well. Um, I was really amazed, though, that just about everybody in Lesotho speaks English, in addition to their their local language with, with which is Sesutu. And so the the opportunity to for me to learn a couple of words, you know, from each of these places was, you know, was a nice opportunity. Um, I still remember one or two words, but I, I won't try to say them now because they may not sound as right as they should. So um, but language, language is such an amazing thing. And, and, and so this morning, we are going to spend some time exploring two instances um, of how God used language to save the human race from themselves. Right? And the first of those instances we would find in Genesis chapter 11. Uh, so Genesis chapter 11, if you want to turn there with me, we're going to be spending a little bit of time there this morning. So uh, keep your fingers there on, on that page in your Bibles. But Genesis chapter 11, and I'm going to read from verses 1 to 9. Right? Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And it says this, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as many as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had a brick for stone and the two men for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, 
and they all have one language. And, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left of building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Dear gracious Father, as we explore this, this particular story in your word this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of us this morning, that you would speak to our hearts as we have all opened up our hearts to receive from you what you have in store for us. Speak through me. It's my prayer this time. In Jesus' name. So just, just so that you, you, you understand um, how it is the human race got to, to this point in, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, let's, let's go right back to the beginning, all right? And uh, work our way up to this point in, in the biblical story. And so in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, uh, we see that this story begins with God creating the heavens and the earth and, and all that is in on the earth, including uh, the, the human race. At some point after being created, um, Adam and Eve uh, attempted to sin against God, and so they give in to this temptation and therefore sin against God and are subsequently kicked out of, of the Garden of Eden. Now, after being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve begin to have children, and it is one of their children, Cain, to be specific, who commits the first murder, killing his own brother. Um, however, Adam and Eve continue having children, and then grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and so on. And... So, in so doing, essentially obeyed God's command that he gave them in Genesis 1.28, where he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and, and, and so on. Now, as the population on earth grew, human beings began to grow more and more sinful, so much so that God says to them, says about them, to, to Noah, um, in Genesis chapter 6, uh, verses 5 and 7, we see God saying, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now, that's, that's sad, you know, when, when the world gets to that place where God is saying that he regrets. But this, this sinfulness on the earth leads to a flood wiping out all of life from earth except for the lives of Noah and his, his wife and his three sons and their wives and um, a bunch of animals that, you know, will accompany them on, on the ark. And so after the flood, God commands Noah and his family and we see this in Genesis 9, where he says, And you, be fruitful and multiply. The same command that he gave to Adam and Eve. Right? And he's in, uh, continuing with that command, he says, Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Right? And then he proceeds to...
to make a promise to Noah. And we can read that promise in, in chapter 9, verses 11 to 17, where he says this, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And so, after this promise is made, after Noah was commanded to be fruitful and multiply, uh, the population on earth begins to grow again. And we see in Genesis 11 that their actions are in opposition to God's commands, God's command to fill the earth. And they are bold in their distrust of God while seeking their own interests. Now you may ask, Pastor, how, how did you come up with that? Well, God told them to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. But they were determined to be all together in one place for fear of being scattered abroad. Right? And we read that in, in, in the passage that we read earlier in, in 11, between 1 and 9. Right? Another thing is God promised that he would never destroy all life again by flood. But they were determined to try their very best to be prepared if there was ever another flood. Now, how do we know this? How, how, how do we come up with that? Well, they, they baked their bricks thoroughly, it says, instead of using the common mud brick of, of their time so that the bricks were more durable. And they used bitumen. Some translations would say tar or asphalt or pitch. It, and for you know, they're all along the same lines of, 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 of consistency and, and what they offer to, to whatever is used on. And so the, the same thing is used um, to seal the ark, right? God, when God instructed Noah to build the ark, it was the same thing that he told Noah to use to seal the, the ark, inside and out of the ark. It's the same thing that was used on, in that basket that Moses was placed in when he was placed in, in that, on that lake um, as his parents tried to save him from being killed by, by Pharaoh's men. It's the same thing that we use on our roads today to save our roads, you know, to make sure that our roads are safe and that, that water isn't getting through and, and causing, you know, the... the stuff that's underneath the, the pavement of our roads to be eroded and, and, and compromise the safety of our roads. We see here that they were intending to build a tall enough tower to escape any flood, you know, because they're thinking that the floods are not going to reach up to the heavens. And so they wanted a waterproof tower that they can potentially use if there was another flood. Even though God said, and he made an everlasting covenant, it was he didn't just say to Noah, look, you know, I'm 
It's not going to happen again in your lifetime, but it's an everlasting covenant. And so, in addition to all of this, um, so we see here that they were pursuing some, some a, a, a kind of security that can be achieved by their own ingenuity um, and hard work rather than the kind of security that could be found um, through faith in God. Moreover, they were more interested in making a name for themselves than in making God's name great. Right? They were more interested in having the world know that they were a powerful people and determined to show that by the city and the tower that they would build. And this is what I believe didn't sit right with God. Rather than depending on God to make their name great, rather than attributing their power to the Almighty God, rather than trusting in the everlasting promise of God, they sought to do what they thought would bring them everlasting honor. So, in order to save the human race from its own idolatrous demise, God sees it fit to confuse their language so that they no longer understood each other, resulting in them being scattered across the earth like they should have been in the first place. We see here great, and even though we see, see God feeling it necessary to, to stop what it is they were doing, we see here a great display of unity. Although it's by a rebellious human race agreeing all to work together against God. God knows and he saw them the powerful possibilities of a united group and he had to step in to, to hinder their rebellion for their own lives. Right? Now, how does this apply to us? You know, where is there anything we can learn from this? Well, do we, in, in the way we speak or behave, come across at times as being in denial of the power of God? Right? Do, do we at times fail in attributing the many blessings that we enjoy, in attributing uh, these blessings back? To God from whom they came? Do we think of ourselves as more powerful, wiser, more independent than we ought to be thinking of ourselves? We see the Apostle Paul saying to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, he says, they will act religious but they will reject the power that could make them godly. And then he says, stay away from people like that. Are we in danger of being one of those people that Paul says to Timothy, stay away from them? We must never forget that sin always leads to confusion. It always leads to scatteredness and broken relationships. It always sows the seeds of its own destruction. Now, the, the second instance of this, this where, where Paul, um, sorry, where God uses language to, to help save the human race from itself. Uh, while we see in, in the first group of people that they were denying the power of God, therefore leading to great confusion in their language, uh, in this second instance, we see the evidence of God's power doing the very opposite. And it's, 
it's amazing. I, I started looking at, at this message um, just as, as CAM meeting was starting. And I I have a quarterly, but I, I, I'm confessing to you that I, I don't use it. So I, I had no idea that the lesson today would be talking about the power of the Holy Spirit when it comes to witnessing. But that's just how the Holy Spirit works, right? Right, and so the second instance that we're looking at is in Acts chapter 2, which we, we spent some time on this morning in our discussion. Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to be looking at this is 1 to 11. All right? And so we see, we see it saying here, um, as described by Luke, says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. All right? When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Right? You all following? Now, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now, I'm sure we can figure out how it is, you know, all of these different nations came about and because we just spent some time looking at that. And if you didn't get that, maybe I need to, to assess how it is I present God's word. But I hope you got that. That you got how it is we we are at, at this place where there are many nations, many languages, and at okay, and it says so. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language and they were amazed and astonished saying are not all these who are speaking Galileans and how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia Judea and Cappadocia Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to the Cyre to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And so we see here a very clear, very clear telling um, of the barriers of language being broken down by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the events of, of Pentecost and the beginnings of the early church call, calls us all to be aware and to be sensitive to God's presence in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. These events highlight the benefits of being united, not in rebellion to God, seeking to make a name for ourselves, but rather in tune and in harmony with the purpose of God as inspired and revealed by the Holy Spirit. These events show us what can happen when we choose to do as Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 33, where he says, but seek first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. The unity that is the result of the empowering of the Holy Spirit is what I pray for today for all of our churches. Not so that we may make a name for ourselves, but so that the name of God will be continually lifted high in each and every one of our lives and in, in us as a collective body of, of, of um, believers. There's, there's another language that I want us to spend a few moments on though. And I, I dare say this is the only truly that this particular language is only truly possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul, the Apostle Paul, tells us at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, after he encourages the church in Corinth to be a united body, comparing the church to the physical body and, and, and how the, the physical body, the members of the physical body are all working together, um, he says this right at the end of 1 Corinthians 12. He says, and I will show you still a more excellent way. And then he goes in to that chapter that we, we know so well as, as the chapter of love. And in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Now, as a trumpet player, I've had the opportunity to sit in a band. And most often, the case, the trumpeters would have the unfortunate opportunity of sitting right at the back of the orchestra, just in front of the drums and cymbals and all the loud percussion. And I, I will never forget, in the middle of a performance once, the, the drummer and the percussionist right behind me in this piece, he, he had never played the cymbals so loud before. But he was right behind me and I just about almost fell off of my chair when he clashed those cymbals because they were so loud and startling. And here we see Paul comparing those who speak, who appear to be all religious and full of, of, of speech and, and so on, but without love, we see Paul comparing to that clanging symbol. And he continues, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. He says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. 
So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Friends, our love for God and for others as influenced by the Holy Spirit can be our greatest witness to Jesus Christ. And in fact, Jesus tells his disciples in John 13, 35, he says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for only the people that are around you. Is that what he says? Does he say that, that they will know that you are my disciples if you only love the people that you like? No. He says have love for one another. Now, he, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking that to mean one another as everybody else. Right? Not just the people I like, not just the people I feel like loving, not just... And then he commands them in John 15, 12, he says... This is my commandment, not, not this is my encouragement to you or this is my suggestion. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. We see Jesus' disciples displaying this same sacrificial love that Jesus showed them for each other and for others around them after receiving the Holy Spirit. And we see God adding to their numbers as a body of believers daily those who believe. Now, it's always easy to talk about loving others, but our world today is in such a bad state that being as loving as we are commanded to be is, is, is a scary thought. It's, it's easier to keep ourselves, to keep to ourselves, not, not say too much to others because it's, it's, it's safer that way, right? But let me say this, this this mentality of, of, of our own safety does not help us to grow. Right? This mentality of, of, of trying to protect ourselves from, from the chaos of, of the world around us does not help others to know who Jesus Christ is. This mentality of, of being more concerned about our own safety than that the well-being of everyone around us does not bring about God's purpose in our lives or in the communities or this world. So my encouragement to each and every one of us today is to continually seek the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So let us daily, let us daily not just occasionally, once a week when we come to church or, you know, when we gather for prayer meeting. But let us daily seek an infilling of the Holy Spirit because it is only by the Holy Spirit's power in us that we can be, number one, a unified body proclaiming the good news of the gospel before we even say a word to anyone. It is only by the Holy Spirit's might that our lives can be a reflection of that image of God that we were created to be. It is only by the Holy Spirit's presence in us that we can be that body of lovers that we have been commanded to be. And it is, and, and, and it all really begins with each of us recognizing that we are all in desperate need of God's power. My prayer today is that just like
King David, the one thing that we will wholeheartedly pursue after is to enjoy God's presence in each and every one of our lives, each and every single day. I hope that you will make this your prayer too. Dear Gracious Father, we thank you so much, dear Lord, for your love towards us. We thank you for the, the sacrificial love that was displayed as an example for us, dear Lord, so that we would know when, when your, your Holy Spirit um, leads us to, to display that same love to those around us. We thank you, dear Father, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would continually remind us of our need for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives at every moment of every day. This is my prayer in Jesus' name.